Uh, well, well, thank you for uh, having me here, and congratulations. ASU is so lucky to have you in this leadership role, uh, and uh, you know it's fantastic that there is the the Sweetie Center uh, on Sustainable Food and Nutrition. And really, I you know the thing I'd like to share a few thoughts today on our global food system and how we can take both climate and nutrition more seriously as core objectives in how we produce and distribute food at home and around the planet. Uh, but no one is better qualified to talk about that than you. And uh, one of the things I learned from Kathleen was early on, uh, you could be principled and committed. Uh, and in addition to that, in order to be effective, you also had to really understand uh, why things were the way they were, You know, why the politics are the way they are, why our food system is the way it is. And, and work through all that to make some real things happen. And she did in her role as Deputy Secretary at USDA. And so I think o o ASU is very fortunate to have you in tow. <laughs> so congratulations to you. Uh, just a few words about the Rock. Do you want me to just share a little bit about the Rockefeller Please. Foundation? I mean, I think many of, you, uh, many of you might have worked with us in one capacity or certainly know about the Rockefeller Foundation. But I am excited to be uh, at Rockefeller today. Uh, it, as you know, is an institution that's more than 105 years old. Uh, one of the things I learned that I loved was that John D. Rockefeller created it with this massive endowment that was, you know, at the time of an extraordinary scale. Uh, and he did it before there was an income tax. You know? So there was no tax deduction to benefit, uh, benefit them. Uh, but they also did it before the federal government, uh, you know, this was in 1913, before the federal government played a major role in creating a safety net for Americans who are vulnerable. And in that context, they, they sort of, uh, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and others created this ethic that Americans who've been uh, exceptionally fortunate should give back in order, and with a focus on helping the vulnerable succeed over time. And Carnegie, as you know, built libraries around this country at the time for low-income kids and families to get access to education. I mean, that was the, the way to get there. Uh, and they were reading rooms for, for people that you know, could go in and just touch and feel and, and learn from books. Rockefeller took a science-based approach and said, you know, we were looking for what are the areas of science you could invest in such that over time it could, that, that investment could lift all of humanity. And from those very early letters between John D. Rockefeller Sr. and his advisor and pastor, a gentleman named Frederick Gates, uh, they concluded that the most important things they could do would be bring science to agriculture and health as ways to transform the lives of the most people around the world. And that led to the creation of the modern field of public health uh, at home and abroad. And it led to, of course, significant investments in agriculture that have given us uh, the Green Revolution and all of its extraordinary positive contributions to productivity and welfare, and also some of its intended challenges on climate and sustainability and nutrition. And so when I started, I said, look, that, that formula has worked for a long time. We're going to stick with it. And so today we are a partner-driven, science-driven, global philanthropy that works on health, food, power, mostly renewable energy access for the poor, uh, and jobs. And our jobs work is focused largely in and around America. So that's, that's what we do overall and, and how we do it. Cool. Uh, do you want me to say a little bit about the food work, or did you want to get into that? I don't even that? have to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> well, what, so, uh, well, I'm going to say one thing, and then I'd love for you to react to it, because I, I was excited coming over here to get the opportunity to hear your thoughts on some of these things. Uh, but I, I think it is time for us as a global community, and certainly those of us in this room, uh, some of us, many of us, have a long history working together with each other on these issues to be even more focused and serious about the impact of food and the food system on both our health and on our climate. And those are easy to say, and everyone in this room kind of gets it. So I feel like it's not a shocking insight to you that our food system uh, has, a, makes major contributions to our health. But it might be shocking to, to sort of really grapple with the concept that 
in most parts or many parts of the world, our food system is making us sick. And that's probably a level of attribution that in an academic setting from a scientific perspective, one can't prove entirely just yet. But, uh, but it is in fact true that we still live, we live in a world where 1.9, maybe 2 billion people are undernourished, uh, including those who are overweight or, and obese because they're nourished improperly. And I think as we learn more and more about the correlation between food intake and long-term chronic disease and disability, we're going to find that a greater percentage of total global morbidity um, and mortality is, is due to the food we consume and the way we consume it. And, and uh, you know, that should cause us to ask some questions as a community about what, what can we do that's different. Uh, similarly, I, I don't know about you, but I have, uh, I see uh, Robert Bonney and others here. I mean, again, you all get this better than anybody, but uh, when you look at how urgent our climate crisis has become, and you think about, well, you know, I read all this stuff and say, okay, I run a major global foundation. We should do something about it. And then you say, what are the, what's the main thing you can do about it? Everyone reads about climate and assumes the main thing you should do is phase out coal and introduce large-scale renewable energy. But the truth is, the number one thing we could do to reduce the impact we have on the climate is change the way we produce food. And I, I saw a set of statistics from a group called Project Drawdown, which I found very powerful that showed that food and agriculture solutions have the potential to reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide by more than 320 gigatons. And it's hard for me to get my head around 320 gigatons as a number. Uh, but what I know is that's more than all of the solution sets that are available in electricity generation. So it's more like shifting entirely to renewables is about 240 gigatons. Uh, changing the way our buildings and cities and transportation sector use power in total is about another 100 gigatons. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I have young kids and, and kids in particular, I think, are even more wired into the importance of climate change than we are, than often uh, their parents are. Uh, but, but they don't all under, you know, it's not common knowledge that the single most powerful thing you could do to reduce our carbon footprint and, and our methane footprint in particular is change our food system. And, and so with those two big insights uh, that you all are aware of in mind, we are embarking at Rockefeller on an effort led by Dr. Roy Steiner, who joined us uh, just a few months ago, to think about the, a role we could play in investing in science, bringing together public and private partners, launching new collaborations, investing in venture-backed companies that are at the forefront of the food technology revolution, and exploring what we can do to really change the food system's impact on those two outcomes in a profound way. And I, and I, I will say, I learned from you early on a lot of the intersections between environment and food. And you, you've been so strong on sustainability that I'd love to hear your thoughts, especially in the context of a farm bill mm. uh, that is being debated right now. You know, what, I'd love to just hear your thoughts on that issue. Hmm. Okay, uh, uh, that's not how it's supposed to work. <laughs> so uh, my thoughts on the farm bill, um, my co colleagues who work really, really hard in this farm bill, and I always say to grassroots groups, it's, it's a little bit depressing, but you have to put in the same amount of energy and time and resources to have the power to say no as you do to have creative things happen. And I think what we're seeing in this farm bill is largely a status quo farm bill. And so it's hard for me to get excited. Yeah. And it, it really does uh, intrigue me. What is it that has to happen to change the narrative, to change yeah. the dynamic for the next farm bill? And to that end, I'm really interested, Raj, when you talk about food systems. Now, 12 years ago, I had this lovely young woman. She's one of my doctoral students at Tufts. And she wanted to do her dissertation on food systems. And I discouraged it because there was no literature out there. Yes, it was a bad decision. Thank you. I see the eyebrows raised. But there was no literature out there. Yeah. There was no discipline. It was like she was going to be the first. And that's always hard to be the first, right? And now everyone's talking about food systems. But do you think that that's really penetrated? And on your website, um, it does 
say the interest in food, you know, you, you use that word system. So um, what do you think the main drivers are with people thinking about it in a systemic way? Yeah. And is that a positive yeah. thing? Is that, is that the change that's needed? Uh, well, I do think, I think it is part of the change that's needed. And I guess we, to me, when we use the phrase food system, instead of just saying food and agriculture, it, it uh, is at least intended to be more inclusive of different communities that play a big role in shaping those outcomes. So, you know, our uh, largest processed packaged food companies in America are, you know, they are, uh, they do what they do, they are what they are to the scale of what they are, but they live in a world where the policymakers have shaped for decades an incentive structure that you know, has made certain things more costly, certain things less costly, and they optimize within that part of the system. So if you don't understand the incentives that are set by now 50, 60 years of, uh, in particular, subsidization of a staple grain food economy that, you know, pursues largely one type of uh, production system in its most economic form, uh, you know, you'd be hard pressed to kind of say, how do you change the reality of the foods people produce, market, and consume without changing the underlying policy incentives that got us there? Uh, similarly, if you look at especially young people, but when and how people shape their food consumption preferences are influenced by such a broad array of constructs that have everything to do with culture and, as Roy uh, who has like two PhDs so he can say this, like love of certain foods <laughs> versus others and, and the, you know, the, the uh, what food reminds you of in your cultural heritage and background, uh, but also relative pricing and awareness of health and everything else. Uh, you, that's a system that you have to affect if you're going to change the way in America, hundreds of millions and around the world, billions of people uh, seek and consume certain types of food products. And we're not going to have big impacts on our environment or our health outcomes at population scale unless we create that kind of change. So that's, when we use food systems, we, that's why we use it. And I'm, I, I'm constantly surprised by how people will talk about all the right things but not, you know, want to avoid the policy side. Well, oh, that's just the way it is and therefore you know, this is a status quo farm bill, so that's just the way it is. Uh, and, and then we end up tinkering on the margins as opposed to really driving real change in a more holistic way. So I have a question about leadership. Okay. Um, you're a medical doctor and you're an Aggie. I am. Those things don't <laughs> normally come, you know, they're not uh, tied together. And so I'm curious, um, you've, you've played a role, a leadership role in a lot of organizations. Obviously, you're a very successful leader. Who are some of the leaders that you look up to? Or they may not still be with us. I noticed that Bob Berglund passed away, and he was one of my favorite secretaries um, over the weekend. But who are some of the leaders you look up to, and, and why do you think they were successful? And what is it about them that you emulate? Well. I do feel fortunate that I've gotten to work with a lot of extraordinary people, and uh, as have you. And so you pick up, hopefully, you <laughs> pick up, you know, bits and pieces of, of what they have to offer. I, I I always have a tremendous respect for Bill Gates because he, you know, he's someone who early on had a global vision. You know, back when a computer was the size of this beautiful building, he was like, oh, everyone's going to have one of those on their desk. And you know, we don't, it's not like we walk around and we're like, oh, that's a lovely building. Everyone's going to have one on their desk someday. Uh, but he had that vision, and it was informed by an, un, an ability to see a future that, that very, very few people could see, uh, and then the determination to affect the world at that scale. And so early on, when we started with philanthropy with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, we would say, OK, well, there are 11 million kids dying under the age of five every year. That number should be close to zero. How do you get there? And that was just a different conversation than, uh, you know, what's something good we could do that would make a difference, right? It was this determined quantitative focus on scale 
and solving problems at global scale and getting all the way there. And because you're working with someone who put software you know, on, on everyone's desk, you, you sort of understood, OK, we're not going to relent until we've achieved that level of scale. And in fact, all those early conversations led to the immunization efforts that they and others have supported. And 500, 600 million kids have been immunized, and 6 million kids a year are saved and, and don't die anymore in that context. And that's a, that's a big at scale outcome 15, 16 years after those early discussions. So I learned from Bill the kind of concept around thinking at scale and being quantitative and focused and not trying to not be too distracted by just doing good in different kind of one off pieces. Uh, I've, I loved working with Tom. Vilsack, who, and he's got a lot of friends and, and uh, mentees in the room here. You know what Tom, Tom taught me was just like, you can't beat something with nothing, he used to say <laughs> all the time, still does. And, and just being really practical, meeting people where they are, and, and working through stuff in a determined, hands-on way. And I, I, it was a venue through which I could see, wow, you could take you know, the power you have in government and use it in a really determined way. But to do it, you got to roll up your sleeves and not stand on ceremony and just dig in and get it done. Um, and, and so that was a, a lesson learned from, from Tom. I will say one of my early experiences just so highly motivated me was time with Dr. Borlaug. Because when we started the Gates Ag program, he had a lot of time for us at that in those years. And uh, and he was already older, you know. I, I, don't, know, I don't remember exactly how old, uh, but you know, he'd give. But he would just have so much energy and persistence for what he cared about. And I had a chance to visit with him in his hotel rooms at conferences, to go out to his home and be with his family. Uh, and I just the per, the combination of his extraordinary persistence, right? Like he'd be, he would wake up from a nap in the afternoon and then drill into you for 90 minutes in a detailed way why, why agricultural research was the most important thing for the world and how bad it was that we weren't all doing everything we could to make that uh, front of mind. Uh, coupled with this humility, I remember at that same discussion in his home uh, when he wanted, he said, he said something like, do you guys want to see the medals? And I was with Jeff Rakes at the time who ran the Gates Foundation. And we're like, sure, thinking he would you know, point to a wall or take us to a room that had all these extraordinary human achievements and accomplishments like on the wall. Uh, and so he, he reached over to his daughter. He said, can you go to the bank and get the medals? And she came back with a Kroger grocery bag, <laughs> put it on the coffee table. And he'd be like, go ahead, see what you find. We'd reach out, and you'd pull out the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and he'd be like, wow. But you know, he, 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 I mean, folks here have had the chance to spend time with him. He didn't stand on ceremony and was just determined fiercely determined. So those are some of the leadership characteristics I try, try, try to, to learn and sometimes copy. That's great. Thank you. So back to being both an Aggie and a doctor. So you have a different scan than some of us uh, for that reason. When you're looking out across the space that we all operate in, are there innovations out there that you find exciting that leave you with hope? Uh, absolutely. Well, first, I think there's just there's some new frontiers of health sciences that we're learning that are going to, over time, elevate the importance of our agricultural community's expertise and understanding the impact on human health. Uh, one in particular, in my view, is the microbiome and our understanding of basic gut health uh, and whatever it ends up being over time, uh, whether, you know, we, we will, what we will know 15 years from now relative to 15 years ago about it's not just what you put in people or what people put in themselves, but what actually gets absorbed and what doesn't and why and what about the gut health and overall microbial environment intermediate that uh, has a lot to do with ultimately health. Uh, I think that's a huge area of scientific exploration that's going to bear a lot of fruit and change the way, like 20 years from now, I think people won't think of food as just food. Like this, this distinction we make between food and medicine will get increasingly combined. Uh, 
I think another, another area is as we understand even more about certain types of chronic diseases, whether it's diabetes or atherosclerosis, you see the underlying science of nutrition that has a lot to do with that. And I think that's still evolving. So I, I see on the medical side, you know, cardiologists, medical research communities, the biopharmaceutical research industry, over time moving towards taking food more seriously um, and understanding nutrition much, much, much more seriously as a driver of health. That's a great thing for those of us in this room because that other community has a lot more capital to put into research, R&D, uh, and, and frankly, you know, I don't want to offend, but is seen as more science-based, uh, which is unfortunate because they haven't for decades paid enough attention to, you know, some real underlying drivers of human health. Uh, but I see a lot of big breakthroughs coming from the medical side and a medical appreciation. On the food side, some of the things we're very excited about have to do with, you know, soil conservation and health and much more understanding of soil quality in the context of, of uh, food and the nutrition in food. Uh, a much bigger appreciation for, uh, you know, what could we do to change the way we produce animal protein and consume animal protein. I say this as a avid, uh, like sous vide steak is my favorite. It's kind of my only kitchen trick. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but it is, uh, you know, we know the basic conversion of uh, calories in to calories out in, in beef is the least efficient way to produce protein. Uh, and, you know, any, almost any other kind of animal protein is much, much, much more efficient. Insect protein? Are you including it, insect protein every, there? Well, everything's more efficient. Not necessarily everything's more desirable. But if you're feeding animals fish. Yeah. or fish and you're grinding it up and mixing it in, uh, in, in feed, it seems very reasonable that insect protein could be a big part of feed uh, for, for livestock and other, other types of animal protein production systems. But even for humans, uh, you know, changing the way we produce protein and looking at alternatives is something we're pretty enthusiastic about. And it's a long trajectory, but if you think about it, there's still two or three billion people who over the next couple of decades will go up that protein curve, uh, which, uh, you know, has been widely acknowledged when you go from like $2 a day to 10 or $15 a day, the thing people demand at an even greater rate of demand than that income curve is protein. And so how that world produces and consumes protein for itself will have a lot uh, of impact on our climate and on their health. And we ought to have some better solutions than, than the cow uh, over time. But I know that can be controversial. And at the end of the day, we're going to need bits and pieces of every type of production system in a modern food, global food economy. But the piece that's really left out especially in our economy here, are alternatives to animal proteins that satisfy the human desire for animal protein. So I was looking at your website, beautiful website, by the way, and I saw the tagline, protecting the well-being of humanity throughout the world. Well, I would say that's a true BHAG, as they say, right? That's, yeah, that's yeah. big. Okay, yeah. go for it. Um, but when I'm reflective, I say, so are the sustainable development goals, yeah. all 17 of them. Each mm -hmm. one in itself is a BHAG, right? It's just sort of overwhelming. So reflecting on the SDG, SDGs that we've all, all these countries have agreed to, well, maybe the US will pull out of that too, I don't know, but um, if they know how. But uh, how do we the feed the world and do it with sustainability at the core, and how are you thinking about connecting the work of the Rockefeller Foundation with the SDGs? Well, I mean, I think two things, science and partnerships. So we'll invest on the front end in scientific arrangements that allow more and more people to do research in the areas we just spoke about. Some of that will be in an academic context. A lot of that, I think, will be in a public-private context. Uh, if you look at, for whatever reason, the food system in particular, there's in my view, quite a lot of interesting work being done in venture capital-backed private companies. That's great because if they weren't doing it, it's not clear that 
we would have as much exposure to alternative proteins, the front end of insect-based protein manufacturing, and all the other science-based tools that are being developed in that context. It's probably not ideal in the sense that a lot of those tools and a lot of those scientific strategies, uh, if they were in the public domain, would, would allow for a much broader scientific approach to rethinking our food system in the future. And this isn't just true in food. Across uh, lots of different sectors, uh, we see more innovation happening in private venture-backed environments uh, compared to 30, 50, 50 you know, years, decades ago when more of that happened in big public projects that made the research more accessible. So we're going to have to figure that out, but, but we'll do a lot in that space on the R&D side. The other area is in big public-private partnerships. So you know, if we can help uh, develop the regulatory frameworks and even encourage companies in Africa to market and, and uh, go to market with alternative proteins and see what happens with that sort of an approach, that would be, I think, a systems innovation that we're not seeing happen at, at scale. And particularly being on the front end of those things before you know, a, a huge percentage of, the, of certain populations goes up that protein curve. So I, um, I, I like that last comment. Well, I like all the comments, I should say. But I like that last comment because I always admired the work of the late um, Professor Calusis Juma up at uh. Harvard. And I lo learned a lot from him about how, as Americans, we like to go into the other parts of the world and say, here's how you do it. And that was particularly pronounced in the whole arena around biotechnology. Mm -hmm. And he was very strong about how we had to invest in countries' capacity building so that they could come up with their own regulatory regimes that they believed in and that fit their culture and their values. I don't know if you have a reflection on that. Well, he was fearless, and he did that often when he would be then critiqued by you know, either local civil society groups or more likely um, certain types of NGOs that you know, had different opinions, but he stuck with it, and I had a lot of respect and still do for, for what he accomplished. Uh, but I think he's exactly right. His point was every environment is different, and so if you're living in a country where 30% of GDP is still in the agricultural sector and 60 plus percent of employment is still in that sector, uh, that environment should have all the tools they need and that they want to be successful. And you know, we, they should have uh, scientists that are developing a broad range of options. They should have regulatory systems that help by their own standards and based on their own cost benefit analyses determine which products work for that population from a risk benefit perspective, which might be different mm -hmm. than in the United States or certainly in Europe. So uh, I, I think that's exactly right. I think we should keep doing that. And I think we should do that with this whole suite of new food technology products that might or might not be considered you know, uh, transgenic in, in, their, in their production, but are novel for food. Uh, and I think we'll play a bigger role in the global food system if we get it right. OK, I have two more questions. I know probably people are chomping at the bit. <laughs> but um, as promised, I will. And this is sort of my own personal quest. It is the year of the woman, so they say. Uh, yeah, I'm waiting for that year of the woman. But OK, <laughs> I'll live long enough, I hope. So just reflecting on that work balance thing, uh, you've got a lot of women who work with you, uh, for you. You've got children, you're managing a family. Do you have any insights after this tumultuous year and where we are as a society in having, you know, we're not talking about country X and women have no land tenure or whatever. I'm really talking about here in the yeah. United States. Um, what's going on? Any thoughts? Well, I, I can say at the Rockefeller Foundation, 65, just over 65% of our staff are women. Uh, and I think in the sector overall, in philanthropy, in professional philanthropy, so, so foundations that are structured as such, I think the number is almost 70% uh, of the total staff are women. So in this sector, we see, you know, we see that as an even more important area of focus. Uh, and, but the challenges, they, you know, women 
members of the Rockefeller Foundation face, I think, are quite similar to anywhere else. It's, it's, uh, it's all of the intendant issues you just described. You know, plus, in addition to that, a foundation is a tough, is, can be, you know, there aren't that many jobs. I mean, we're only a couple hundred people in the US, and most foundations, I think Gates is a couple, you know, 1,500 maybe outside of them. Most foundations are going to be much, much, much smaller. So networking is more important and harder to do. Uh, the, the sort of linear pathway of I'll be at a place for 30 years and every couple years get promoted is not quite possible because we just don't have that many layers and that many jobs, right? So, uh, so we try to do more for our uh, staff through our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives that include a women's leadership initiative and, and, and expanded opportunities for networking. Uh, I spent some of my time, and I'm going to make this request of you privately. I'll do it here, too, if you'd like, of just getting extraordinary women leaders to come talk about their uh, stories because they're everywhere, and they're extremely successful, and not, it's never easy. Uh, and I think understanding that and seeing that, that it's never easy is helpful. I also, both of us probably have a big shout out for uh, the former first lady. And I think her book tour and some of her very frank comments have been like, thank you. Um, and it is hard and, and we work through it. But it is incumbent on us uh, when we get to run institutions, uh, whether, uh, whether in academia or philanthropy or, or corporate, to create environments where everyone has a chance to flourish and be successful and to be flexible in the modern work environment and to create services so that everyone can kind of balance work and life. I, I don't think I've ever gotten it right personally, but, but institutionally it's, our, it's a commitment we have to our team. It's much, much easier being the questioner than the answer because I don't have it right in my household yeah. either, but for all my friends in the audience, hold me to the fire. I wanna ask that in every forum that I do because I think it's an important issue and it's top of mind now and I think that's a good thing. All right, so my last question is the hardest, of course. Uh -huh. Oh, great. So I had this thing when I was deputy secretary, I don't remember uh, if you would remember, but I had a little sticky note on my phone. And it was also, it started when I was AMS administrator during the Clinton administration. Because you have this big job yeah. with these huge goals, like you do now, and yet there's, there's only so much you can actually do. You have the vision, it drives you, and you have to do stepwise to get there. Um, so if you had a sticky, Raj, and you looked out and you thought in the next year, these are three things I really must accomplish. Are you ready to tell us at least what one of them might be? <laughs> <laughs> Only if you'll tell us what's on your sticky. OK, all right, we have a deal. Uh, yeah, for us, it's, you know, for, for me, just on my sticky, the first and foremost thing is we've had a lot of changes in our leadership and our structure and the issues we focus on over the last 18 months. I've been there 18 months. So goal number one for me on that front is, is building a culture of performance and urgency at the Rockefeller Foundation. That, that can be hard to do at any institution and in particular at, at places that have uh, you know, hard-earned brands like the Rockefeller Foundation. Like, you know, if I asked you, do you love the Rockefeller Foundation, I hope you would say yes, especially in the food and ag community. Uh, but we are loved in a lot of parts of the world. And that's true whether you're talking to like a, an, an African farmer in rural Kenya or a scientist at, at the University of Arizona or Arizona State or, you know, uh, a, a big company executive uh, like Paul Pullman who runs Unilever. <laughs> A lot of people have a lot of positive experiences working with Rockefeller over a very long period of time. But that can't be, that we can't just sort of rest on that. You know, we have to believe, we have to kind of fight for what's our green revolution going to be in this era, in this period of time, and invest with urgency and, and work extra hard to get there. So that's goal number one. Uh, goal number two is standing up initiatives in our four focus areas, health, food, power, and jobs that are operational at scale, that work to help tens or hundreds of millions of people lift themselves out of poverty. And I won't take up time describing them, but I'm really excited about the way that work is unfolding, uh, including efforts to end disparities in maternal mortality and 
bring renewable clean energy to tens of millions of rural Indians who don't have it and learn from that and expand into Myanmar and Africa and, and all types of things. So, so those big high impact initiatives is goal number two. Uh, and goal number three for us is to, to stay on the new frontiers of the future. You mentioned a, a mission statement that John D. Rockefeller himself insisted never changes. That's why it's what it is, which is we, are, we, we serve to uh, improve the state of humanity. And when I got there, I said, well, that's a little broad. So let's, just, should we change that to make it more narrow? They're like, oh, you can't change it. That was his. And I'm glad it's not changeable, because it forces you to step back and say, do we really understand how artificial intelligence and data science is going to change the nature of human interaction and the allocation of human welfare and what it even means to be uh, thriving or flourishing as an individual or a family or a community? And so we do a whole lot of work uh, to explore the new frontiers of where science, technology, and innovation can reshape humanity writ large. A lot of it's exploratory. Most of it should fail in terms of, you know, didn't lead to something that, that grows. But every now and then, something will come out of that that is a spark of real transformation. And we'll stay focused on finding a few of those sparks in 2019. So those are my three. <laughs>